Hello and welcome back to the podcast. The podcast is Tanner Talks About Stuff That Happened. I am Tanner and I'm going to talk about some stuff that happened today. And the stuff that happened today that we're going to be talking about is the events that came to be known as the Arab Spring. Now, this was a collection of events that spanned over 15 countries and it's hard to condense all of that information into a single episode in the format that I'm trying to do um, with the condensing of information that I try to do on this podcast. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to condense all of this information and give you a very basic outline of the events that took place, except I will detail a lot of what happened in the country of Tunisia because that is where most of the, that that is where the Arab Spring was instigated, and so I think it's important to remember all of the things that came to pass inside that country specifically. But there's so many countries where the Arab Spring spread to, and to talk about each of those countries individually, it'd be a whole lot of information that would be very difficult to retain. So I'm just going to give you a basic outline as I try to do in each of the episodes. So without further ado, let's just start. All right, first of all, what was the Arab Spring? So the Arab Spring was a series of anti-government protests, uprisings, and armed rebellions that spread across North Africa and the Middle East between December of 2010 and December of 2012, beginning in Tunisia and spreading as far east as Oman, as far north as Syria, as far west as Mauritania, and as far south as Sudan. More specifically, South Sudan, also involving the countries of Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, and Qatar. The the Arab Spring originated in the dissatisfaction with the citizens in these Arab countries with their authoritarian governments and the corruption such governments had bred. And these protests did cause significant change in the region in terms of governance. It's also thought that this chain of events led to protests in other non-Arab countries that coincided with the spring or followed shortly after, including Greece, Turkey, Albania, Azerbaijan, Uganda, Iran, Cameroon, and and a lot of others. So the coolest thing for me about the Arab Spring uh, in terms of this podcast is that these events are the first historical event I've covered in this podcast that I actually remember living through. In the school that I went to, we uh, we would tune into something called Channel One News um, during lunch hour every single day, and it'd give us a brief outline of all of the things that were going on in the world. And during the Arab Spring, I remember every single day, there was something new to learn about, some new development with the Arab Spring. It was almost like some new country was revolting. And it's remarkable for me to be able to remember these events taking place as I cover them now in a historical podcast, 10 years, uh, 12 years actually after they took place. So that's why I'm excited to talk about this one. The epicenter of the Arab Spring is a small town square in the center of Sidi Bouzid. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's S-I-D-I-B-O-U-Z-I-D. I I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but that's how I'm just going to keep saying it because I, I don't know otherwise. So, uh, Sidi Bozid is a city in central Tunisia with a population of around 50,000. An interesting fact about the city, it had become one of the first to experience combat during a sequence of events that would come to be remembered as the Battle of Kasserine Pass in World War II. And many buildings still show signs of the conflict. And in the center of this town is where the most widespread movement in the Arab world in a decade began. President Zin al-Abidin Ben Ali had been the ruler of a one-party state since the coup d'etat in 1987. A few vocabulary words for you here. First, a one-party state, a single-party state, a one-party system, or a single-party system is a type of state in which one political party has the right to form the government, usually based on the existing constitution. All other parties are either outlawed or allowed to take only a limited and controlled participation in elections. Nazi Germany, the People's Republic of China, Cuba, uh, North Korea, these are some examples of one-party states or single-party systems. Second, a coup d'etat is typically an illegal unconstitutional seizure of power by a political faction, the military, or a dictator. Basically, an overthrow of the current government by a political force rather than by a popular uprising. Okay, now back to Tunisia. 
Since 1987, President Ben Ali had been the leader of Tunisia, and though his rule had been economically prosperous for the country, characterized by growth of the private sector and foreign investment, there were widespread rumors of political suppression of his opponents. In 2008, protests in Tunisia lasted several months, but these protests against the government were rarely covered in media of the country, despite 90% of media outlets being privately owned and operated rather than government run. And this led to political opposition as the people felt that Ben Ali's rule was becoming more authoritative than he was letting on. And this is where we find ourselves in December of 2010. Mohamed Bouazizi was a lifelong Tunisian resident and entrepreneur. And for seven years, he'd sold produce in the town square of Sidi Bouzid from a humble cart. He was the sole provider for his household of nine. And he was well-liked in the town, routinely giving fruit and vegetables to poor families in the city. Unfortunately, Sidi Bouzid was a hotbed of corruption in the country of Tunisia, and health inspectors would often demand bribes from street vendors under threat of confiscation of their products or their wares. And more than once before, Mohammed had refused to pay the bribes and had his equipment confiscated, and supposedly, law enforcement had been harassing him for years. So around 10 a.m. on December 17th, 2010, a local female inspector, Faida Hamdi, came around and began confiscating Mohammed's equipment, citing that he did not have a proper permit to sell. Fun fact, according to the city's head of employment and independent work, Absolutely no permit is needed to be a street vendor in City Bozid. So for obvious reasons, Mohammed resisted, stating that this work was the only way for him to feed his family, and the inspector summoned police after he refused to bribe her. Upon arrival, the police began beating Mohammed and confiscated his equipment and produce. Furious and humiliated, Mohammed traveled to the governor's office where he requested to meet with the governor to voice his complaints and ask for his equipment to be returned, but he was denied an audience. When turned away, standing in front of the building, Mohammed shouted, If you won't see me, I'll burn myself. The governor again refused. Irate, Mohammed required a can of gas from a nearby gas station and stood in the middle of the street before the governor's office. Eyewitnesses say that at 11.30 a.m., barely an hour after Mohammed was confronted by a health inspector, Mohammed shouted, How do you expect me to make a living? Before dousing himself in gasoline, he then took a match from his pocket, struck it on the pavement, and set himself on fire. Though onlookers rushed to douse the flames, it was too late. Mohammed Bouazizi had suffered severe burns to 90% of his body and had only narrowly survived the suicide attempt. He was rushed to a nearby hospital and held in an intensive care burn unit. After onlookers pieced together the story from the unlawful confiscation of property to Mohammed's self-immolation, unrest began to take root in the city within hours, and in the following weeks, as Mohammed's condition worsened, these protests would grow, fueled by an increased police presence in the city and reports of police brutality being used on young protesters. To add to this, WikiLeaks released a series of documents highlighting corruption in the Tunisian government, giving further reason for the nation to protest. As these protests reached a fever pitch on January 4th, 2011, Mohamed Bouazizi had fallen into a comatose state and died of his injuries sealing his fate as a political martyr. He was 26 years old. Public outcry in Tunisia was immense. Protests in Sidi Bozid had grown and become violent and had trickled into neighboring territories and cities in Tunisia. But with Mohammed's death, the entire country exploded into opposition. Along with protesting the treatment of Mohammed Bouazizi, they began protesting the corruption of the government and the Ben Ali regime, along with rising food prices and unemployment. It was pointed out that Ben Ali and his ministers lived in opulent mansions while people such as Mohammed Bouazizi lived, in, lived on only a few dollars a day to feed their large families. 
Tunisia had attempted to limit press coverage of the events in the country, but social media had begun to play an integral part in the events that would transpire as the Arab Spring played out. Videos and images of riot police beating young protesters with batons and firing tear gas into crowds of people began circulating. And in one instance, a video of a canister of tear gas being vi fired accidentally into a local mosque went viral. Protesters responded with rage, ransacking buildings, setting fire to a bus, burning tires in the street, and destroying two cars, all in the capital of Tunis, the largest city in Tunisia. By January 12th, the situation in the country was rapidly destabilizing. An Italian reporter stated that he and his cameraman had been beaten with batons by police when they attempted to document the events. The footage provided more ammunition for the angry Tunisian demonstrators, and the world began to take notice of what was happening in this relatively small North African country. In a desperate attempt to regain some form of control, President Ben Ali ordered a curfew to be instituted. The protesters hardly took notice. On January 14th, a photojournalist for the European Press Photo Agency, Lucas Dolega, was documenting the protests when he was hit in the head by a tear gas canister fired by a police officer at point-blank range. He died of his injuries two days later. Further testimony revealed that he had been standing on a street corner with a group of foreign photographers when the canister was fired, and it had been fired horizontally, which meant that the officer had intentionally targeted members of foreign press. The revelation was met with international outrage. Lucas had been in the country for less than 48 hours, and he'd become the first member of foreign press to become a casualty of the Arab Spring uprisings. Well, President Ben Ali was having a very bad month, and he wasn't handling it gracefully, no matter how hard he tried to pretend that he was. In December, a bit, after, a bit more than a week after the protest began, he appeared on a national television broadcast criticizing the protesters and labeling them, quote, extremists and mercenaries. He warned of swift punishment and accused foreign news channels of spreading falsehoods and twisting the truth for their own purposes. Needless to say, his rhetoric was soundly ignored by the populace. On December 29th, Ben Ali removed his communications minister from office and dismissed the governors of Sidi Bozid. He announced changes to legislation regarding trade, religious affairs, and youth portfolios. But these changes, too, were ignored. In January, Ben Ali declared that he would create 300,000 more jobs for the country, though he offered no evidence to support the plausibility of this statement. Simultaneously, he delivered more inflammatory rhetoric, stating that the protests were, quote, a terrorist act that cannot be overlooked. Also in January, Reporters Without Borders, the international nonprofit and non governmental news agency that safeguards the right to freedom of information, stated that at least six bloggers and prominent activists had either been arrested or disappeared from Tunisia through the course of the protests, also stating that the number was likely higher. On January 10th, Ben Ali's regime announced the indefinite closure of all schools and universities in the country in an attempt to quell the unrest, but things were set in motion and could not be turned back. The same day, Ben Ali stated that he would not under any circumstance make changes to the constitution requiring him to step down in 2014 due to his age. But by January 14th, Ben Ali accepted that the situation was undeniably out of control and could quickly turn to civil war. In one sweeping gesture, he dissolved the Tunisian government and declared a state of emergency, stating that gatherings of more than three people were illegal and could result in arrest or death if found. He called for elections in six months in a last-ditch effort to defuse the situation aimed at forcing him out of office, but once again, it didn't work. The same day, Ben Ali closed the Tunisian airspace and the Tunisian military com commandeered the Tunis-Carthage airport. With his presidency hanging by a thread, President Zain El Abidin Ben Ali fled the country, eventually landing his plane in Saudi Arabia, who only agreed to grant him asylum if he vowed to stay out of politics. The president agreed. <laughs> 
The next morning, on January 15th, two days shy of a month after Mohammed Bouazizi lit himself on fire in front of the office of the governor of Sidi Bouzid, Ben Ali resigned from all political positions in Tunisia. But it was far from over. Celebrations in the cities across the country were boisterous but short-lived, as the state nearly fell into anarchy as protesters continued to clash with police due to the cruelty instituted during the last month of protests. The Tunisian government fumbled over the presidency, with no one wanting to, wanting to take charge of such a volatile situation. Violence and looting were rampant. The central train station in Tunis was burned to the ground. A prison director freed 1,000 inmates after a prison rebellion broke out. Residents running out of food and supplies boarded up their homes and armed themselves, sometimes barricading entire neighborhoods in seemingly apocalyptic survivalist fashion. The Tunisian army was deployed across the nation, with firefights occurring between Tunisian soldiers and security forces at the presidential palace still loyal to the former regime. Gunfire could still be heard in the capital of Tunis as disorganized police forces struggled to maintain some semblance of law and order. It was a mess. While internet freedom is usually a good thing, the sudden increase of access to social media platforms following the collapse of the Ben Ali regime led to more videos of police brutality and the true depth of corruption in Tunisian government being revealed. The Tunisian people were furious, and the existence of a Tunisian state hung by a thread. The rest of the Arab world took notice. A similar governmental situation had taken place in Algeria, Tunisia's western neighbor, between 1988 and 1991, when political riots broke out and forced the government to adapt to a parliamentary system. But the military had staged a coup d'etat, nullifying the results of the elections and leading to a 10-year civil war. In 1999, civilian government was re-established, but it quickly became corrupt. The president had a habit of amending the constitution to keep himself in office and winning all elections that had suspiciously low voter turnouts. In 2010, protests were already pretty commonplace in Algeria as the Algerian people had grown very weary of war and corruption in the country. The Tunisian situation only poured alcohol on the fire. Between January 3rd and January 10th, 2011, riots broke out across Algeria, triggered by rising food, gasoline, sugar, and flour prices instituted by the government. Algerian police vigorously attempted to stifle the protests. On January 14th, protests erupted in Jordan, spreading the Arab Spring beyond North Africa and into the Middle East. On January 17th, demonstrations began in Oman. On January 25th, the people of Egypt began to riot. January 26th, the, the Syrian population began a civil uprising. January 27th, Yemeni protests begin. January 28th, protests in Djibouti begin. January 30th, Sudanese protests begin. February 10th, riots in Palestine related to the Arab Spring begin. February 12th, Iraq. February 14th, Bahrain. February 15th, Libya. February 19th, Kuwait. February 20th, Morocco. February 25th, Mauritania. February 27th, Lebanon. March 11th, Saudi Arabia. In barely three months, the populations of more than 15 Arab countries had banded together to voice their dissatisfaction with their respective governments. The authoritarian era of these Arab countries seemed to be at an end. But what were the outcomes of these protests? Well, for the sake of time, here is a brief breakdown. By the time the Arab Spring came to an end, four governments had been overthrown. Tunisia, which we've discussed. Algeria, who adopted a new constitution expressly stating that the president could no longer create frivolous amendments arbitrarily. Egypt, which led to the Egyptian crisis in which the Council of Armed Forces took control in a botched election with a new Islamist leader, and unrest continued all the way until 2013 when another government overthrow took place before the situation started to stabilize. And in Yemen, 
where the government was overthrown, resulting in the Yemeni crisis, which continues to this day because during the unrest, insurgent groups used the protests as a method of taking control of the territories in the region. Six countries would experience protests that would lead to governmental changes. Jordan, where they instituted a constitutional review and all 42 articles of the constitution were amended. Oman, where increased authority was given to the legislature of the country rather than sole authority being in the presidency. Kuwait, where the corrupt parliament was dissolved and the prime minister resigned. Morocco, King Mohammed VI conceded much of his power to the legislature. There was much constitutional reform and civil liberties in the country were increased and stringent anti-corruption legislation was established. And Lebanon, where in time, the government would collapse under the pressure and a new government would be instituted. Four governments would experience civil war following the Arab Spring, most notably Libya and the overthrow of the dictator Muammar Gaddafi, which I actually remember watching that on television, which is kind of cool that I'm researching it now as a historical topic. Syria would also experience the eruption of civil war, with the repercussions of which are still felt today, along with Yemen and Iraq. The Arab Spring, in a proper sense, came to an end in December of 2012 as governments that had not been overthrown or instituted change generally ordered brutal crackdowns on dissenting populations and many of the countries that experienced protests only saw minimal change in the function of their governments, either for the better or the worse. Now here is a final sobering collection of numbers. I love numbers and I love statistics. And so this is why I want to put this into the episode, because I believe it's important to see the humanitarian effect of these protests. It's estimated that between 60,000 and 140,000 people lost their lives as a result of the unrest during the Arab Spring. Included in that are 22 reporters who attempted to document the horrors of revolution. An indirect result of the Arab Spring was the rise or rebirth of many insurgent groups that dot the region even today, almost 10 years later, including ISIS and ISIL, the insurgency in Egypt, the Yemeni crisis, among others, and many argue that this period of insurgency can be referred to as the Arab Winter, a play on words from the Arab Spring. Tensions never faded entirely, and in 2019, a wave of uprising and protest movements occurred in Algeria, Sudan, Iraq, Lebanon, and Egypt, all echoes of the Arab Spring that occurred eight years earlier. Strikingly enough, all of these events can be traced back to a small marketplace in Tunisia where a young man decided that he'd had enough, setting off a chain of events that would be remembered forever as the Arab Spring. It's worth noting that following the end of the Arab Spring, Tunisia was the only country affected by the Arab Spring that instituted a constitutional democratic government which exists today. We can only hope that if productive change comes to the Arab world again, it will not require such anger, violence, and loss as was felt during the Arab Spring between December of 2010 and December of 2012. All right, and that's it for this episode. Thanks for tuning in to Tanner Talks About Stuff That Happened. This was a fun episode because it was very interesting for me to go back and revisit these events that I remember watching in the middle of a middle school classroom on a television screen. And now I have the opportunity to go back and research them and see really what happened and dissect all of these different events and... This was really fun for me. So thank you all for listening. Um, if you enjoy the podcast, head over to... Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, uh, Breaker, wherever you can review podcasts and leave us a five-star review. It really, really, really does help us get more people involved about the conversations in history and make sure we get some accurate information out there. So thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast and I uh, hope you enjoy. Hope you join me next week. I'll be back. Catch you then.